All right. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day. My name is Brother Ed, and I have Brother Mike Basile with me this evening. And we'd like to welcome you to a Monday night Bible Q&A, KJV Bible Scope. And uh, we're going to do our best to answer questions this evening. I do sorry, uh, I do apologize for the last broadcast. We just tried to start the Q&A and some technical difficulties happened. And I do apologize for that. But we're going to try to get this thing going. Um, know that if you ask questions according to the email on the bottom of your screen, that we'll do our best to answer those questions. Uh, we have a whole week to be able to answer the question that's in chronological order and we'll go in order, but ask your questions because we're running low on questions. That's trust the Lord Jesus at gmail.com. You can ask a question and me and brother Mike and brother Justin will do our best to give you a Bible answer. But what better than to have the right answer when somebody asks you, if you died today, where would your soul spend eternity? Amen. And uh, if you can say that I believe that Jesus died for my sins and rose again the third day for the salvation of my soul, and I know I'm saved because that's what I'm trusting in for my salvation, what a great thing, because you are saved according to the word of God, the Holy Bible. That is a great thing. And if you're, if you're saved today, why would you not want to live your life victoriously for Jesus? We should strive every day. Not all of us are complete uh, conformities to Christ, but we can certainly strive every day. To, and, and the Holy Spirit and God the Father and Jesus Christ enables us to live victoriously each and every day. And I think victorious Christian living is more so in the desire in the choosing of the free will every day to respond to God. I think that is victorious. Amen. And, and none of us are going to have it all figured out, but I think that's what God meant when he wants us to live in victory every day, choosing for Jesus every day, correcting the old things and going on to the new things of the new creature in Christ. I, I, that is a great thing. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to let brother Mike open up. Go ahead, brother. All right. Good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back. We enjoy answering these questions. I enjoy setting them out. I hope you enjoy Bible study. I hope you enjoy reading God's Word. I hope you read it every day. Get into God's Word. and The more you read it, the more comes out of it. But, but like Brother Ed said, if you're not saved, you need to get saved. We can answer all your questions, and you can die and go to hell with your questions. We want, we want you to go to heaven. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He shed his blood on the cross for you, for me, for everybody. But it's a personal thing. Jesus Christ died for me. And I want you to go to heaven someday. I wouldn't want to answer your questions, but I want to see you in heaven someday. Hey Amen. Appreciate that, Brother Mike. Uh, I do apologize. Uh, I don't, uh, Brother Justin did not join us this evening. And I was just checking uh, on the screen to see if he popped in. Uh, yeah, he, he probably won't be joining us this evening. I do apologize. He does have a lot of prior uh, engagements that he has to deal with. Uh, so uh, we're just going to do it ourselves. So, uh, amen. Let's go ahead and get on with it. We're going to get to this first question here uh, on your screen. I'm sorry if it, did, if it didn't fit. The whole thing is not going to fit on the screen here, so it's a little bit long. So I'm going to go ahead and throw it up there. And, and remember, I'm not going to be calling out any names uh, of the people that ask the questions because we're avoiding doing that just so we can focus on the question and nobody has to feel like they're being attacked or anything like that, okay? So let's go ahead and do it. Without further ado, uh, Dear Bible Q&A Brethren, Revelation 1.5. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Revelation 7, 14. And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Please help clarify my understanding of these verses. I have been taught that Revelation 1, 5 are the church age of grace saints saved by faith alone. And Revelation 7, 14 are the tribulation saints saved by faith and works. Thank you for your labor in the word and doctrine. So last week, I kind of did the uh, did the go ahead and went first. Uh, go ahead, Brother Mike. You got this one first this time. Amen. All right. Well, Revelation 1.5. Um, we'll start there. And from Jesus Christ, who is a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins 
in his own blood. That is salvation that we're talking about. We opened up. That is Jesus Christ dying on a cross, shedding his blood for salvation. So compare to scripture, Colossians 1 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. 1 John 1 7, uh, if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Titus 3 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Those in Revelation 1 5 are those that are born again. Saved by the blood of the Lamb, raptured, or die in their sin and go to heaven, or <laughs> get up in the rapture. Those are the those, that's, those are the ones in Revelation one five. Now, but Revelation seven fourteen. Let's take a look at that. If my computer will work for me, and I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto, said to me, These are they which came out of the out of great tribulation. And have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, to understand this, we have to read pretty much the entire chapter. So we're going to go ahead and go through Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 17, and understand there are two groups here and understand who these two groups are. So, Revelation chapter 7, and after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor in the sea, nor in any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having a seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice unto the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed in 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And it goes to all the tribes, the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Asher, Asher, the tribe of Nathanim, Manasseh, Zebulun, Joseph. Twelve tribes, 12,000 from each tribe. Let's pick up in verse 8. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robe and palms in their hands. And cry with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which array, are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore <laughs> are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them. He shall lead them into living fountains of the water, and God shall wipe away tears from all their eyes. That's a lot to read. I think it's important, though. Let's go back to verse 15 now. Um, it, and, it said, and I said to him, Sir, thou knowest. What that means is him saying, I don't know. You know. Tell me. And then he said unto me, These are they. So there's two groups in this passage. In verses 1 through 8, there's two groups. And verses 9 through 17 is a second group. In verses 1 through 8, these are Jews only. In verses 9 through 17, these are people from every nation, including Gentiles. Verses 1 through 8, they're numbered, 144,000. Verses 9 through 17, no man can number. Two separate groups. Verses 1 through 8, these are sealed and protected. Verses 9 through 17, not sealed, and many have died. Verses 1 through 8, they were seen witnessing on the earth. 9 through 17, they're seen worshiping in heaven. 1 through 8, they're God's missionaries. 9 through 17, these are missionary converts. 1 through 8, they enter into the kingdom. And 9 through 17, they share the kingdom with Israel. Two different groups, two separate things. 
You have to identify who they are. You have to use scripture against scripture, or you will be confused. There's a lot of churches that are confused with this because they don't rightly divide. No, the ones referring to this verse are not to redeem, are not de are redeemed through Christ's blood, but it is a salvation through his power. Now, I'm getting a lot of this from Brother James's book on, on Revelation. Brand new book. It's a two, two, um, it's not a commercial. A two, a two, <laughs> I, Amen. I, I, I got a lot of it from there. So I'm going to give credit where credit is due. Brother James, I got a lot of that. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to read a portion of this book now. Amen. Try to enlighten you as to what it is. I'm not going to try to reinvent the wheel. This is this is perfect in the way it's written. So I'm going to read part of this book to you and I'm going to pass it over to Brother Ann. So, verse 714, wash their robes. What is the robe in which these saints appear before God? The quick answer is to quote Isaiah 61.10. He hath covered me with his the robe of righteousness. How beautifully the robe speaks of the covering for the shame of our nakedness, which came through our sin. Or we could point to Jeremiah 23.6, wherein he, we are told, This is the name whereby we shall be called the Lord our righteousness. How well this matches the New Testament truth that Christ is made unto us righteousness, 1 Corinthians 1.30. We, we could then point to the robe given to the prodigal son by his father who rejoiced over his return. Luke 15, 22. Well, all this is true. It is not true here. For the robe discussed above cannot be washed and made white by its owner. The revelation has its own distinct phraseology here. It's perfect harmony with the line of truth which, which it takes up. The robe is still the symbol of righteousness. But in view of the context, it is practical righteousness, not something wrought by another. This righteousness did not come from Jesus or Christ. It's a practical righteousness. For us, but wrought by these saints. It is completely different um, from the Lord's parable and in no wise contradictory, though it is different. While these tribulation saints know there is no cleansing agent of the soul or the outer man apart from the blood of the Lamb, they are standing on the solid rock of scriptural faith. Unlike many false pr pr professors in the seven churches, these tribulation saints have done more than receive the imputed merits of the precious blood. They have used it, they have used it, to wash their outward appearance and testimony in the eyes of the world. Today, too many who name the name of Christ live in conformity to the world. Even in lands where it would cost them nothing to be sanctified. In this country, I can stand in a street corner and hold a sign and pass out tracts and, and street preach. I, I suffer no persecution. Someone may, just, someone may drive by and say I'm number one, or someone may drive by and cuss me out. That's not persecution. I have freedom, I have liberty to do that in this country. During the tribulation, it will cost one everything, including their life, to walk in holiness before the Lord. I am not in fear of my life. I stood in the street today. I was not in fear of my life. The saints pictured here are commended for having devoted themselves with that measure of devotion. In the blood of the Lamb, the tribulation saints are in heaven via the blood of the Lamb, not keeping of the law. So the he he is right. Verse one five is the saint saved through the blood of the Lamb <clears throat> on their way to heaven, eternal security, eternal life. Fourteen, seven fourteen is the the saints that have either been martyred because of their faith or were taken out later. Um, so you have to make sure you distinguish between the two. Pretty easy passage to understand if you read the passage in context. Brother Ed? All right. Thank you, Brother Mike. Hey, Brother Mike uh, did the commer the Revelation commercial, amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Appreciate that. I needed that Revelation commercial on this uh, Monday night Bible Q&A. And who better than Brother Mike, amen. That was a great, great commercial, amen. I like that. Amen. So... 
Brother Mike beat me to the punch. Uh, yeah, he 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 got it, man. He he. I was gonna read you the commentary in that on Revelation <laughs> seven fourteen. Amen. So since Brother Mike had already read you that, I'm just going to cover what he read already. I'm just going to make a few comments about it. I don't have to read it to you. You already got that in information. So do you notice um, in the question here from our brother, Revelation 1, 5, unto him that loved us, washed us, he, that's uh, the Lord, washed us from our sins in his own blood. And in Revelation 7, 14, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So see, they, they are washing their robes. Jesus isn't washing their robes. They are washing their own robes. So, and you want some clarification on that, right? So, there should be no element of misunderstanding about Revelation 1, 5, I would think. But you'd be surprised how a lot of people don't believe Revelation 1 5 is dealing with you know the church age saints and so you're we definitely need to cover this so even though you may believe that or folks on here may believe that i think it'd be wise to go over it to make sure that we kind of know rightly divided what these seven churches are all about in revelations chapters one through four while they're still on earth and the kind of the overview and the look at these churches might be, be helpful as well for the answer to Revelation 1.5 to make sure that we're clear. We don't have any misunderstandings. False doctrine can't creep in. We we'll get a little bit of context, a little bit of overview, and we'll kind of, uh, you know, just clear out some fog, you know. So I'll read you my notes here. Almost all commentators set forth a threefold division of the book based upon Revelation 1.19. However, there is a more precise fourfold division based upon the four times John is situated for viewing. Number one, from Patmos, he views the church age, Revelation chapter 1, 9 to 322. Number two, from heaven, he views the tribulation, Revelation 4, 1 to 17, 2. Point three, from the wilderness, he views God's destruction of the world powers and the end of all that offends. Revelation 17, three to Revelation 21, nine. And then finally, point four, from a mountain, he views eternity. Revelation 21, 10 to 22, 21. So the seven churches receive revelation regarding the future. This revelation covers the present church age, the future Tribulation, the millennial kingdom, and the eternal ages, Revelation 119. The letters to the seven churches are contained in chapters 2 to 3 and should be studied as, point one, historically, they, they present an outline of the history of the New Testament church. Point two, doctrinally, that what were the errors condemned in each case? See that? And point three, practically, how may we apply the admonitions given each of these churches to our own personal walk with God? So see how you, you can study those things. And yes, they do apply to us today, even though we're in the book of Revelation. <laughs> the book of Revelation covers many dispensations. It even talks about things in the past in the old testament it talks about things in the first advent of christ it talks about things in the church age it talks about things in the tribulation it even it even goes a little bit of detail of the rapture and then you got eternity mentioned so revelation can cover all dispensations so just because you're in the book of revelation doesn't mean that you're only dealing with end times Ain't that what we do? Hey, come on, whenever you hear about the word revelation, all you're thinking of is end times. But it's not only end times. Because when you start revelation, we're dealing with the immediate churches at the time, as well as the principle for all church ages. Mm. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover some of that in a minute. Since Mike already hammered the other parts for me, that's great. Great stuff, though, brother. I'm not talking to you for that. Great stuff. Amen. So, um, the uh, Mike did a great job on Revelation 1 5, um, covered some great cross references with that. I got nothing to add to that. I think it was great. Um, Jesus Christ washed us from our sins in his own blood, 
And that's to, let's read it. And from Jesus Christ, who was the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, us. I can say that today. He loved me today. Washed us from our sins in his own blood. It's, it's kind of like rendering 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, or was it only the Corinthians? <laughs> no. No, we understand that there were letters written to those, written to those specific churches but even though it was written to those specific churches, it did not only direct the truths in the scope of only those churches. The scope is clear in the passages that they apply to all saved members of the body of Christ. So you see how you can end up hyper dividing and end up making it to where Galatians don't apply to us today because it was written to the Galatian church at the time when they were living in that day. Well, the, the, the book of Ephesians don't apply to us. And I know a lot of the hyper dispensationalists like to um, apply, you know, Ephesians to them and, and, Again, you can do the same hyper divided argument and say, well, the book of Ephesians was written specifically to the church at Ephesus. And you can read that in the opening and the closing. So watch out when you rightly divide and not end up hyper dividing and then you're stuck in hyper dispensationalism. So watch out. Because you can end up hyper dividing like they do, and they say, well, only the prison epistles apply to the church. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, and that's it. Nothing else applies to you. You mean the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, don't apply to us? What about when Jesus said, you must be born again? I don't know. No, they'll say, no, none of that applies to you. So watch out when you're hyper dividing that you, re you recognize you're hyper dividing. Because everybody that's hyper dividing doesn't think they're hyper dividing. <laughs> okay, so so watch out for that. Okay, so that's just an admonition there. So uh, Revelation one five, read it carefully. You can understand that yes, we are going to be able to transition from the immediate churches to you know the tribulation after Revelation four, uh, between Revelation three and four. Uh, you're going to see that uh, there's a come up hither. And that is the rapture there. And, and maybe, you know, maybe we can hit that since we got a little bit of time here to do that. Uh, go to Revelation 4. And let's see if I can find it. Yeah, Revelation 4, 1. Look at this. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened. So remember, uh, before Revelation 4, 1, we got Revelation 3 on back to 1, right? Revelation 1. All that context there is dealing with the seven churches, the immediate seven churches that are on earth. And you can also apply those. And again, I'm going to cover that in a minute. Uh, the church ages. OK. And uh, two apply. Uh, both renderings apply. So but let's read this. After this, I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was that as it were of a trumpet talking with me. Hey, that's a. Uh, <laughs> What is that? First Thessalonians 4, 16. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel, the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. How about that for a cross reference there? Amen. Correctly, not some old Stephen Anderson crazy a worldly divided rendering of 1 Thessalonians 4 and Matthew 24. What a mess, guys. Revelation 4 is your cross reference. Look, look, it says, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. You know, we got we got John literally being raptured up, right? But it's not only a picture of, I mean, we got a picture going on here. We not only got the reality of John being raptured up, but it's also a picture of the church being raptured up. Because the church, nowhere after Revelation 4.1 does the Bible in Revelation deal with the church on earth anymore? It deals with the church. You'll read about the church later in the, in the book of Revelation. But it will never deal with the church on earth anymore. How about that? I think that's very important to note. So you got to come up hither right there in Revelation 4.1. What a great picture that is of the rapture after John is dealing with the seven churches from 1 to 3. Amen. Praise the Lord. So 
rest assured, Revelation 1, uh, chapters 1 all the way to 3, you can rest assured we're dealing with the church age there. See, there should be no questionable uh, doubt about that. I mean, we should know for certain about these things. Okay, so, because um, they're crystal clear in the Bible. So, we have wash their robes. Now, let me make a comment on that as well. I know, I know Mike did a great job reading that. Um, they, wa they wash their robes. Remember that. This isn't, this isn't Jesus washing their robes and making them white as snow. This is a practical righteousness. They've already trusted in Christ. They've all, they're, they're already there. They're already in, by grace through faith of what God has revealed to them, these tribulation saints. So they're, they've trusted God by faith. And now there's this practical righteousness they're doing with their own robes. Okay, so watch out because y these uh, repentance guys and some even some Baptist churches, you got to watch out for this. They'll try to use this as some kind of a uh, look. They're washing their robes. See that you got to do something. You can't just say you're saved. You got to wash those robes. <laughs> there's some works involved in the tribulation, right? Ain't that what the whole washing there is, right? They're saying there's some works. It's not. It's practical righteousness. It has nothing to do with Jesus saving them by them washing their robes or right. something they have to do. So we must be clear about this because if that's the case, then we have a lot of contradictions in the Bible about Jesus paying it all, that Jesus who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. He didn't bear our sins. He bore some of our sins because we, because the tribulation saints have to wash their robes. They have to physically do some work. See, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't comport with the rest of clear scripture and what we know of the doctrine of salvation clearly without a shadow of a doubt we know that christ died for our sins he didn't die for some of our sins and then let us do our part no he died for all our sins when he died on the cross he said it is finished right, right? It, he didn't say it's begun he didn't say you have to finish it he didn't say endure to the end he didn't say wash your robes and and then you know you did your part no he none of that he said it is finished very important because all those verses mean nothing. I'm talking about these clear passages of salvation scripture mean nothing if you can stick something like that in there. And, and I contend people will do it. People will do it because they somehow in man, they got to corrupt the word of God somehow, even though we, in, we have light of clear passage of salvation scripture. You've got to read these things carefully. You know, if there's something you don't understand in the Bible, I would say, Never attack the doctrine of what Christ did on the cross. You know what it means? It means I don't understand something about this passage. I am not going to take my, my beginning readings of a shady passage of scripture and then judge it by my heart instead of, wait, there's something wrong here. It's me. I'm seeing something wrong. It's not the Bible. The Bible is clear about salvation. There's something wrong with me. I need to learn more in the Bible about this doctrine here of what I'm, what I'm reading. And maybe it'll clear up the more I learn instead of concluding that it must be works and grace. Because <laughs> remember, I want you to go here real quick for me. Since, uh, you know, Mike covered that one. I, I just want to hit this one. Uh, it's about works and grace. Because I, I just want to get the, uh, in the, into the spirit of this, that Bible can't contradict. It's so important. Now, go to Romans eleven six. Because, you know, when people give doctrines like this, right? I mean, they'll just give you a doctrine, and they know it contradicts what you believe most of the time, if you already set forth what you believe. And then they'll set that one forth as to be a contradiction to what you're saying. So what's the problem there? So the question needs to be asked, right? I would ask him, do you believe that the, the King James Bible, and, I mean, we can go there too. The King James Bible is the inspired, preserved word of God. And if it is, it has no contradictions in it because it's impossible for God to lie. That's where I go. And then I, I ask them, now, now you ask me the question, uh, Brother Ed, do you believe that the King James Bible is the inspired, preserved, preserved word of God and that it has no contradictions because it's impossible for God to lie? Because 
contradictions amount to lying, correct? So the Bible has no contradiction. So when a lot of times when these people ask you the question and then you go through what I just what I just said, a lot of times they won't answer. Well, I believe the the well, any Bible just for them. Let's just say any Bible. They won't admit that there is an inspired, preserved word of God that has no contradictions. What they're trying to do is show you a contradiction in what you believe, but yet they won't account for what they, what the, the, the struggle they're having with their contradiction. So they don't care if the Bible has contradictions a lot of times. So we, we as King James Bible believers are big on continuity in the Bible. Why? Because we're taught that way. We're taught through Scripture that God preserved his word and that God is true, that God cannot lie. It's in his character. So all this foundation we're taught from a baby Christian. I mean, if you're, you're going to a great church, a Bible believing church, you're taught that you should be taught that from a baby Christian till, till present time. Right. So you have all this foundation, all this truth. Now you're approaching the Bible or you should be approaching the Bible correctly. And yet this guy that comes along may not approach the Bible that way. And that's why you have this whole, you know, ping pong battle of this alleged contradiction of faith and works. So go to Romans eleven six. I just want to show you this. Look at this. This is interesting. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, <laughs> grace is no more grace. But brother Ed. You know, when you do works, you're cooperating with grace, and therefore it's okay. It's under the banner of grace. No, Romans eleven six specifically defines the difference between grace and works. So you can't trick me, not even in the tribulation saints. You can't trick me, not even in the millennial reign. You can't trick me, not even in eternity. You can't trick me, not in the Old Testament. See that? See, see where we're going? That's why you need to make sure that whatever doctrine you're, you're learning, it it's, has continuity with the clear passages of Scripture, especially when it's based upon foundational doctrine for the New Testament church. Be careful. I mean, we as Christians should know the doctrines of the New Testament, the New Testament church inside out, right? We should. We should know the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of the virgin birth, the doctrine of the deity of Christ, the doctrine of repentance. The doc We should know all these. The problem is your average Bible believer claims strong stand on the King James Bible, but doesn't know the first thing about some of these doctrines. So we need to be careful not to be, uh, you know, ignorant or lazy or slothful and just get in the word of God, and make sure we know these things. So look what it says. And if by grace... Then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. There, it is impossible, according to the Bible definition of grace and works, to mix the two. You can keep them separate. Each one has its place in the word of God. You have salvation by grace through faith. And then you have works that comes after you're saved. It's what we call sanctification. That's what it means. Separated out for the Lord after one is saved. So what a great definition we have right there, according to Romans eleven six. So you might want to go there whenever somebody challenges you with grace and works are together. You can't have one without the other. And then they wrongly divide the book of James. Faith without works is dead. Yeah. Yeah. But then it says, but faith is, it actually says in, in, in James 2, uh, it's alone. Faith is alone. So if faith without works is dead, it's still alone, isn't it? it come on, it's dead faith, but it's still alone. It's still there. It still exists. It's the faith that you had in Christ, but that's all you had. See that? You, don't, you can't lose your salvation. But you can certainly lose a proper relationship with God. You can lose rewards, inheritance, uh, aspects of your inheritance. So that is possible in the Bible, okay? All right. So uh, wash their robes. Hopefully you understand that one. The tribulation saints are in heaven through the blood of the Lamb, not the law. And that was in the book as well, in the Revelation book for 714. And then the language used of this company is not 
one of reigning nor any seen on earth. They are before the throne of God. Day and night is used of eternity. Compare the comforts of 715. Uh, those heavenly blessings are here described. This group is not the church. They are before the throne. The church is Christ's own body and bride is with him in the throne. That's also under 7, 9 to 14 in the Revelation book. Okay, so a little bit of that. Now, let's shift gears a little bit here. Let's shift some gears. I want to talk about the church. And I'm going to read you this section. Uh, also, it's, I think it's covered in the Revelation book. It's an overview of the church age. And I'm, I'm not going to read you everything. I'm just going to read you the things per, are pertinent to Revelation 1.5. OK, so the messages, the messages to the seven churches, Revelation two and three. Go beyond the particular churches of the first century and present a prophetic look at the course of church history. Remember, I said that uh, from the apostolic age, excuse me, to the rapture of the body of Christ. Though this view is widely disputed, we hold to it for many reasons and see why. I mean, we give scriptural reasons. And we use deductive reasoning to figure out what is more in line with Scripture than not. That's how we come to our views, okay? Don't, we don't come to our views because I, I had a goose pimple on the back of my neck, and I was, I got, I, all of a sudden, you know, uh, somebody said something, a key word that made me believe something that God wanted me to know. That's not, come on, that's wavering. That is not correct that's not correct way to get revelation from God. You've got to go to the word of God itself and get understanding out of the word of God. And then you can now rightly divide what you need to do and discern what you need to do according to the actual teaching of the Bible. Okay, so there it is. A um, little bit of a lesson study there. Though this view is widely disputed, we hold to it for many reasons. Point one, the messages go beyond the actual messages that were written to the churches go beyond the particular local body to which they are addressed by the admonition. Listen, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the Church. churches. Revelation 2.29. Point two, those who will hear are not only to hear what was written in a particular letter to their particular church, because remember we said that, for the admonition reads, what the Spirit saith to the church as. This states clearly that what was written to one has application to all. Point three, it would be incredible if in a prophetic book like Revelation concerning the whole period of the existence of the church of God on earth, there should be no prophecy concerning the church. Point four, if a prophetic foreview of the church is to be found in Revelation, it must be found in chapters two and three. For there is no mention of the church on earth after chapter three. And we said that already. See that? Point five, throughout scripture, the number seven indicates a complete statement about something. Seven is one of the most frequent typical numbers of the Bible. It signifies perfection. Fullness, completeness. It therefore suggests in this case that these churches symbolize the whole. How about that? That's pretty cool. Um, uh, point six. It would be incredible that so much space should have been given these churches if nothing symbolic were meant. The book of Revelation is so terse and condensed that only one chapter is given to the millennium and less than one to the second advent of Christ, the second coming of Jesus Christ. The thought that these two chapters, which make up almost 10% of the whole book, should apply only to small congregations of the first century and mean nothing more is not reasonable. See, that's not reasonable. Nobody would believe that. I mean, well, I would say nobody would believe that. See, anybody reasonable wouldn't believe that, right? Point seven. These messages occur in the most symbolic book in the Bible. Come on, the letters to the churches, seven churches. Look, point eight. No one would suggest that the epistles to the Ephesians and Galatians were for those, were for those churches only and did not embrace the whole of the New Testament church through the church age. See that? Cover that. That's hyper dividing when people do that. Point nine. There were at least three other churches in the regions. Colossi, Colossians 1, 2, 
Hierapolis, Colossians 4.13, and Troas, Acts chapter 20, verses 6 to 7. But these churches receive no letters. Huh. The seven churches must then be representative, chosen for certain typical characteristics. Amen. Well, let's try to soak some of that in. Point 10. Most conclusively, these passages do indeed present an exact picture of the history of the church and in precisely the order in which they are given. That's amazing. Chronological order in the time that history presented itself. Come on. This is amazing. This is God's foreknowledge. The parallels between these messages to these assemblies and the history of the church are uh, on earth are too exact and too numerous to be accidental. Because remember, according to God's word and prophecy, we don't believe in chances. We don't believe in Pascal's wager. We don't believe in Pascal and, and the laws of, of common probability. I don't deal in probability when it comes to the Bible. Why do people use probability as a, as a proof that God is, God is true in his prophecies? There's no, there is no chance that it couldn't have happened. I wouldn't use a probability for this. God, God prophesies in his word. And 100%, it comes to pass. There's prophecies in the Bible that haven't came to pass yet. Well, there's some. But they will come to pass. That's the point. We don't need probability. I don't need to go to some, if 17 predictions in the Bible happen by chance, that's one chance in 480 billion times a billion times one trillion. And you know what the unbeliever says? But there's still a chance it might not be true. No, that's, that's wrong. It's true. 100% true. It is impossible for God to lie. I know people try to approach these lousy arguments. But I'm telling you, when I'm giving Bible prophecy to somebody, I'm not approaching it as it might not have happened. I'm giving it as God said it, and it happened. According to all over 300 messianic prophecies, it happened. And now we can trust God at his word, even in that evidence that should increase us in more faith. To believe that the things that haven't came to pass, that God said in his word, will come to pass. You can trust it. He's proven himself over and over again, even in our lives after we were saved. All right. So no true believer would ever have an argument with that, would they? No, it's people that, you know, carnal Christians, people that don't trust the Lord enough, don't believe his word. These, they, they come up with these kinds of arguments. So point 11, some would object that viewing these churches as prophetic, we take them from the things which are Revelation 119 and place them into the realm of things which shall be hereafter, Revelation 119. But the church is one body, is it not? Come on, if I'm in the church, it doesn't matter if somebody died that was in the church, we're still one body. <laughs> well, I, I gotta wrap my mind around that, brother. Right, the church is one body of which John was a part of. And of, of which these churches are a part. What began at Pentecost runs through the age to the catching away. The letters to the seven churches have a fourfold application. So look at this fourfold application. It's local to the churches actually addressed. It's personal, enabling individual saints to discern evil in themselves. It's admonitory as checkpoints whereby any church in any era may test their scriptural state before God. And it's prophetic. Disclosing seven progressive phases of spiritual history of the church. The messages also have a particular structure which must be recognized. The Lord is always presented in a character suited to the moral state of the church address. That's pretty interesting. Do a study of that. That would be interesting. This is of a great importance since it reveals the attitude of Christ toward the, the specific faults indicated in each church. Number one, the first subject mentioned in each address is that which is commendable. The Lord does not walk in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, 2-1, Revelation 2-1, merely to note that that which is evil. He first sets his eyes upon that which pleases him. Two, next, that which is blameworthy is exposed and rebuked. The God of truth will not overlook or cover up iniquity in any church. Number three. 
These rebukes are followed by exhortations and promises, especially to him that overcometh. The promises to the overcomer mark the path of personal obedience in circumstances where the prevailing conditions are evil. Notice that the messages to the seven churches come between two visions. The first is the vision of Christ standing in the midst of the seven candlesticks in chapter 1. The second is the vision of the 24 elders round about the throne in chapter 4. This is the vision of the glorified church with the Lord in heaven. Immediately after this second vision, the tribulation begins and runs its course in the chapters that follow. Thus, the messages deal with history from the glorification of Christ to the glorification of his church. The historical time periods to which the messages to the seven churches refer can be summarized as this. And I'll probably, this will be my last uh, comment here, then we'll close out because we're running close to nine. But really interesting stuff here. Ephesus deals with the, come on, we're, we're going through the phases of the, the historical timeline of the churches here. Ephesus represents the apostolic period. Smyrna represents the Ro Rome persecuting the church. Pergamos represents Rome accepts the church. Thyatira uh, represents Rome controls the church. The result is Roman Catholicism. Sardis is churches pull out of Rome. Philadelphia is the modern mission movement. And Laodicea is the lukewarm megachurch. The result is dead Protestantism. Mm, interesting. Interesting stuff there, guys. So... Revelation 1, according to the question that was asked, you can rest assured we're dealing with church age saints. Bam! See, when you know all that, <laughs> it becomes easy to answer the question. Revelation 7, you are correct when you said they were tribulation saints, but they're not working to get to heaven. They're, come on, they, the reason why they're in heaven is because they've trusted by grace through faith and what Amen. God has revealed to them. Amen. So that's the common denominator throughout all dispensations. Uh, no contradictions there. And one more I'll give you, uh, John 14, 6. Jesus says, come on, this applies to every dispensation of time. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Ultimately, in the end, when everybody's standing in judgment before God. Nobody's going to get to God, but through Jesus Christ. Okay. Nobody, no old Testament saint, no new Testament saint, no tribulation saint. Nobody gets to God, but through Jesus Christ. And it doesn't have to be on earth. Okay. <laughs> you could be in, you could be in paradise going through Christ. Okay. So, amen. There, there it is. So hopefully, you know, that makes sense. Uh, hopefully we we did justice to answer the question. I mean, there's so much uh, more angles that we could travel on to cover, you know, the answers and more practical messages that we could bring. But for the sake of time, we don't have uh, all the time in the world to 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 make you know 20, 30 sermons on this thing. So hopefully there is an understanding there, and then maybe it can expound you more on your own studies by the verses that we gave. And it'd be a help and a blessing to you um, to know that, especially to know that you are eternally secure. Uh, you don't need to work for your salvation. And I don't, I don't, I don't want to be in the tribulation. I, I know you guys don't want to be in the tribulation, especially when you know and you read Revelation what it's all about. Um, you don't want to be there. But if you are there, rest assured that you don't have to work to get to heaven. <laughs> okay, that's the, the tribulation uh, message there. Okay, so. Hopefully that, 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 uh, that'll help you out there. I, I'm not looking forward to the tribulation. I'm going to be out of here. I, I, I have nothing to do with it. Anybody that's in a church has nothing to do with it. So praise the Lord. So if you're saved, if you're saved, hey, keep trusting the gospel. Keep looking back to what Christ did for you and look forward as you look back at what Christ did and then live that, live that life for him. Not because it's a bad thing. Every 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 area of your life that you live for Jesus is always going to be a good thing. It's going to be a good thing in your life, and it's going to be a blessing to God. Amen. What a great thing. If you're not saved, this is for you today. So what do you mean I'm not saved? Acts 17, it calls every person that was created by God an offspring. You're not a child of God. You're an offspring of God. You are created by God. Yes, he created you. But you'll not automatically go to heaven when you die because he created you.
And I, and I, I mean, I used to believe that when I was a, a, a lost and undone person. I used to believe because God created me, I'm going to heaven when I die. I try to do right in my life, and I mean, God's going to smile at me when I get to heaven. No, no, that was a lie. The devil's lie. I was wrong. And you know what? Today, you're wrong. You need to put away your pride. It's not your way. It's God's way, and you have to submit to his way. You've got to meet his standards and what he said that you must do to be saved from your sins. Amen. To avoid the wrath of God, to avoid hell, to, uh, to avoid the eventual lake of fire, the eternal penitentiary for all lost people that reject Jesus Christ. Well, I just said it. Don't reject Jesus Christ. Now, there's a lot of Jesuses in the world, right? For many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ. I know that's for a future time. Passage is in a future time. But we can see the precursors all throughout our history and even presently today that there's many people that want to call themselves Jesus. There are a lot of religions that have a name, the name of Jesus, but it's not the biblical Jesus. My friend, what you need to consider today is the true biblical Jesus. The Jesus of the Holy Bible. He calls out to you. Through the word of God, through the preaching of his word. And he says, will you come to me? Will you believe that I died for your sins and rose again the third day for the salvation of your soul? Will you believe that? And if you believe that, you have believed on me. That's why we say believe on the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. and thou shalt be saved. My friend, will you do that today? If you haven't trusted in Jesus Christ, because a lot of times people get confused with the terminology. When I say, for those that are lost and undone, you say, I don't understand. Well, what does he mean by lost and undone? I'm not lost and undone. I, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm not lost. I mean, I live at home. I'm not lost somewhere on the map. No, you're lost and undone. You're headed for hell without Christ. That's what it means to be lost and undone. It means that you're still yet in your sins. God doesn't want you to be in your sins anymore. He wants to forgive your sins. He wants to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But in order to do that, you got to humble yourself and you got to agree with God that you're a sinner. You got to agree with God that you need his salvation through the only begotten son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you do that. Don't don't wait another minute. Don't procrastinate. Do it as soon as possible tonight, even this very minute, if you can. You don't need to be in a church pew to be saved. You don't need to be in a church altar to be saved. You could be saved right where you're at. I hope you consider that. Uh, if you're lost and undone today, that's what it means. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I'm going to close out with that. I'm going to let Mike close out now. Go ahead, brother. Hey, Amen. Well, I, I enjoyed this study. Uh, again, we borrowed some stuff from other books, but I, I use other people to help me learn God's word. Amen. The pastor is probably the greatest Bible teacher on our planet today. I'm not bragging on him. I, I believe he is. Uh, I learned so much from him, but when he preaches, he spurs me on to more questions. I'll be sitting in the pew thinking, wow, I need to study this out. I need to study this out. He doesn't give me every answer. I also have to go to the Bible. I have to study the Bible. So I hope that what we've done tonight is mm -hmm. cause you to be curious as to the, the whole truth, because we didn't give you every possible, th every possible avenue tonight. We want to spur you on to your own Bible study. We want you to walk closer to God. We appreciate the questions. Please ask more questions. I, I'm enjoying studying them out. But the, the ultimate goal is for each one of us to be closer to God, for each one of us to have a hunger to learn God's word. Again, we do appreciate if you're not saved, please, please consider your eternal soul. Have a great night.